Hi everyone, and welcome to this episode of the iOS Lead Essentials podcast. Here we discuss the strategies in your journey to become a complete senior iOS developer. My name is Bogdan, I'm a senior iOS developer and lead instructor in the iOS Lead Essentials program, the online training program for iOS developers who want to become complete senior developers. Today, our special guest is Trip from the USA, a mid iOS developer and student of the iOS Lead Essentials program. Hi, Trip, and welcome. Hi, Martin. Thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, happy to have you. Okay. Uh, let's start by telling our audience what are some of the achievements you managed to get with the program that we'll be discussing today along with your journey as an iOS developer. Yeah, so the past two months and there was a lot of preparation before that but the past two months i've been interviewing with a lot of big tech companies and i was able to get some offers out of it and i definitely uh, think that this program was a key component for me to getting those offers and we can go into the detail about that in a second that's great and yeah congratulations for uh like getting to the interviews and getting offers like that's that's super uh, nice thank you and for you, you watching this podcast stay until the end to learn how trip did it and you can achieve it too our goal is to find replicable steps that others can follow to achieve the same so trip how long have you been an ios developer i've been doing ios development professionally for over two years I actually started doing iOS development in my free time when I was in high school. I wanted to make an app and I had an iPhone. So it was natural that I would pick iOS development and it was around 2015. So Swift had just come out in 2014 and I, I learned Swift and published my first app on the app store about a year later. I went to university and got a degree in computer science. And after that, I still really loved iOS development. I got an internship uh, at a company doing iOS development. And then after that internship, I went straight into full time and I've worked for two different companies working full time as an iOS developer and for about an, a year each. And I'm about to go to my third company soon. Wow. Nice. First of all, I, I think, yeah, uh, it's a young man's word, right? Uh, yeah. only t- in only two years, you just started with iOS directly after after university and now you're at the door of big big tech companies already so that's a very very fast development of your career so congrats and yeah i'm i'm sure this will continue in the in the following years thank you i hope so okay can can you share how you found out about the lead essentials program yeah i honestly was just looking for resources on YouTube. And I stumbled across the Essential Developer uh, YouTube channel and started watching some of the videos. And I saw that there was a course involved with it too. So I did some research, followed the link, uh, looked at the course. I was really impressed by the depth that the course would cover. And I was really confident that it would get me some of the things that I was looking for. Um, I, at the time, I was really interested in learning about software architecture and design patterns and how that works together. And also, uh, I thought it would be really cool that there was test-driven development taught in the course as well, which is something I haven't had experience with in my current companies. But I find like whenever testing isn't in my code base, it's always a nightmare. So I definitely was excited to learn test driven development and what that was all about. Yeah, that's, that's very nice. Indeed, uh, testing is a game changer. Yeah. Do you remember some of the issues you had or what were you looking for when you when you stumbled across the, the channel and uh, then the program? Yeah, so a little more background on myself. Whenever I had my first internship with a large company that had a, an app on the app store that was had millions of users on it. It was a small team and they were able to get away with using MVC, but the code base, even back then, I'd never had exposure to any 
advanced design patterns or architecture. So I, even back then seeing the MVC and these massive view controllers that resulted from it, uh, I felt that there was something missing and, but I couldn't wrap my hand, like, like finger around it. Cause I just never had the experience before. Um, my next company that I went to after that internship ended, I was really fortunate that they used Viper. So this really got the ground. Um, it really allowed me to hit the ground running with an architecture pattern for UI that was a lot, had a lot of really positive attributes that you don't get from even MVVM. And I, even though we use a template, um, it still made the code base a lot better. I knew that there was a lot of separation of responsibilities throughout the code base. If I wanted to know where the model was being manipulated, then it's in the interactor, right? And so I, it made the code base feel a lot better, but there was still like missing, like Viper on its own isn't going to be a complete architecture because all, in this implementation, all of the views knew about each other. They were not agnostic to the views that come next in the flow, yeah. which is really bad. You don't want that in a large scale application. Yeah. Uh, the next company I went to, we used MVVM and we did have a modular architecture, but it had decayed over time. And there were a lot of cycles and the dependencies within that architecture, which made it pretty much untestable. And so I knew that there were some problems in that code base that I was going to want to try and solve to bring that code base back to when it was completely modular and testable. And I, that's actually the, some of the videos I was looking for that allowed me to stumble across the program was trying to do research on how to solve this issue in my company. And I saw that the, all those things were in the program. So that's why I right. decided to go forward with it. All right. Um, yeah. I, I really like how you how you presented this evolving um, principle of of uh, patterns and how to structure your code in different in those different setups. Um, indeed, Viper is maybe the more I don't know, let's say more complex pattern, yeah. so it can accommodate a bit more responsibility than just MVC, but it's still a template. So. Yeah. It, it, people still end up trying to fit everything into one of the letters. So I, I think that's maybe the biggest issue that we learn to deal with in a different way in the program is to think of architecture as just identifying responsibilities, components, yeah. and the way they work together, as opposed to trying to fit everything into the pattern. Because yeah, indeed in MVC, it's always in the view controller. So at least in Apple MVC. So that's why you get these massive view controls. But even if you uh, use a different pattern, you still kind of get the same the same problems. And it's like you said, the pattern itself won't tell you how to write, let's say, different screens in a way they're not coupled together. So yeah. because especially in big companies, you have a lot of, I don't know, A-B testing and experiments uh, using different implementations for the same screen. So your navigation gets more and more complex. So you cannot have this coupling, whereas it's right. just, it just won't work. So there, there are many aspects and verticals that the, the patterns itself don't, don't solve. So that's why in the, in the course, we kind of say, okay, those are for the UI only, and we can have so many other components and design patterns that we use for different uh, problems. So I'm, I'm glad you kind of saw that because having the experience to work with Viper, with MVC, with the MVVM in different environments kind of show you, shows you that, okay, they're different, but in a way they're kind of the same. So yeah, uh, you end up with the same pattern. problems. Yeah. Also like Viper, for example, like the E is for entity, which in like MVC and MVVM is your model, but it says nothing about what that means. Yeah. And in this course, we spend two whole like modules within the course, just going over your uh, persistence and your networking layers, which is something that those design patterns give you no information about how exactly. it should be done. Exactly. Yeah. And you, most of the times in most apps, those are 
always there, right? There are little to almost no apps that have no network connectivity. So, yeah. I mean, there are a few, but uh, most of the time you have to deal with that and it's never uh, in the UI, right? <laughs> you want to keep that yeah. as fast as away as possible. Yeah. So, you don't okay. want your UI to care about where the data is coming from. Exactly. It is. exactly. You just want it to show the raw information. Do you remember from, from that time what was maybe the most frustrating thing with, with this code base? It's like, where, where did, did it uh, not work for you? I think, so uh, the Viper code base was actually my favorite to work in just because even though it was pretty highly coupled, everything was testable. The MVC code base was testable, but you really have to watch out, especially if you're not using dependency injection well because like it i've seen code bases where the singleton pattern is just heavily abused and yeah. your code becomes a black box that you can't test because you're just calling your singletons freely without yeah. injecting them and that that can be a real problem when you're testing but fortunately like the viper code base the dependency injection was like really nice for that implementation and you could test it but i think testability comes up a lot of people the reason why these code bases i believe get in the states they do is because maybe they don't care about testability and so if you don't care about testability then you can just start plugging things in all over the place and you're never going to test the code so why does it matter but then you end up with this spaghetti mess that in years from now or even months you're not going to be able to extend and maintain over time yeah, yeah. that's true i mean you you if you don't follow testability you still see it at some point like you said uh, for me i i recall instances where i wanted to reuse something maybe in a different project and i mean yeah you would copy over some some class or an implementation and you couldn't compile it because it has like 20 references yeah. to other singletons and or other global state in the app so it's then when you say okay there was no indication in the interface that these dependencies are there but they are so it's like now you have to i don't know drag over more and more components as everything depends on some other things and it's like that and or yeah. you just decide yeah th this is not reusable so yeah better and then rewrite. and then your compile time increases because you have all these dependencies that have to build like that's something huge that i feel like especially i've noticed from these big tech companies i interviewed with is they really care about modularity not only because they have so many ios developers working their code base that they need to be able to a write code here and not impact the rest of the system but because whenever you have that many dependencies they have to recompile every single time yeah. you make any little change and yeah. with these projects you'll run into like 30 minute to an hour long build time yeah. which you're never going to have a multi-billion dollar company doing that yeah exactly and since the apps are so big just building everything takes that long so if you are not careful with the dependencies any change can trigger a full rebuild so it's yeah no way you can do tdd there <laughs> no. you can hardly do regular development even yeah yeah you that's have to it. Like... wait that long for your changes to be to see the fruits of what you just wrote your code like it's not gonna yeah. it's long sprints right yeah so how, how is your career before you joined the program like do you felt like you were you were uh, growing as a developer or how was that like so yeah so i definitely felt like i was growing but it was all due to the effort i put in outside of work i wasn't really getting a ton of like impactful work at my current job in like a meaningful way. Like 
you, it, when, as you get further in your career, employers don't want to just hear that you called an endpoint and just dis- wrote a table view to display some data from that endpoint, yeah. right? You need to be able to be doing large scale impacts across the entire code base, not just UI features. Like, so for example, like architecture and like improving your testability, like in integrating like your CI CD pipelines, things like that. And I wasn't really getting that from my current job. I definitely could have the freedom to do it if I wanted, but it was, I was having to really learn outside of work to get that. But I find that that the most, it, the best iOS developers that I've met, they are doing a lot outside of work. I don't think you're ever going to find a job that teaches you everything there. You're always going to have to put in that extra effort. And I, but I think that's the best way to excel. I think that's why everyone in this essential developer program is, has the same mindset and is really trying to achieve because we all realize that you have to put in that extra work to get to these accomplishments. Totally. Totally. Yeah. I, I agree because even if like, it depends on, on each environment where you, you, where you work, but you either get more specialized in just one of the areas or they don't do enough uh, variation there to, to be, give you the opportunity to learn all those things. Um, so yeah, it's, it's better to, to try to, to learn on your own uh, when possible. Also, now you mentioned CICD. I know a lot of my friends or colleagues that always ran from anything that had to do with CI or CD just because like, this is scary. I don't want to deal with it. It's like you said, I, I'll just do UI features, maybe uh, getting some network calls here and there. And that's it. But yeah. uh, You're, these are, it's not how you get better. Yeah. No, yeah. exactly, exactly. And um, I think once you see these concepts explained, they, they're not that scary anymore. It's not that that complex, but yeah. uh, not knowing how they work, that's that's what's keeping most people away from them. So yeah. So then you decided to join the program. So how how was that? How how did you decide? Yeah, so like I was saying before, there's just a huge list of things that this course covers that I was really excited about learning, you know, like test-driven development, solid principles, like architecture. At the time, I never heard of solid principles for this program. So I uh, caught my eye. I was like, what is, what is that? But it, I knew it had to do with architecture, and I was interested in learning about architecture. So I knew it must be something important that I should learn. I also definitely, like, I've had CIC pipelines uh, in my current job, but I, I've i never been the one that started it from scratch. So I thought that would be really interesting to yeah. learn about. You know, I'm usually going in and maintaining these pipelines. So that, that was a, a big selling point to me. Also, I have been interviewing the past few months and preparing for those interviews. So I haven't been able to use the course to its full potential yet. But just like asking about like, how do I write my resume and how should I prepare for system design interviews for mobile, like all that information I could add all those questions I could ask in the Slack channel. And I got information back from people in the community about all yeah. that. And I really do. I use that information and it worked for me. So I, I think yeah. there's a lot of value there. I also yeah. think it's really cool that there's these opportunities to have these mentoring sessions, you know, like this isn't really a mentoring session per se, but in the course you do get mentoring sessions. And uh, this, I wouldn't have probably gone on this podcast had I not been in the course. And this is a really cool opportunity to do as well. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And my, I would add that our inter- Slack is more, more like a moderated version of Stack Overflow. So, we instructors make sure that the information there is spot on. And that's, for me, that's a big differential because most of the time on Stack Overflow, you just get random re, random posts. Like you have no yeah. idea if they, are, if they are indeed correct or not. So 
that can throw you off if it's really an, a numbers yeah. game. So, yeah, I, okay. I'll also add one more thing. Um, I've been remote my entire career too, so I haven't really been around iOS developers outside of my job, right? So there's over like a thousand members, I think, in this community. Mm -hmm. And just being a part of that and meeting so many people is a big plus too. Yeah, I agree. It, for me, it's still it's still incredible to, to be a part of that. Um, so yeah, let's keep it up. Yeah. Any, any second thoughts when you joined? No, I... No. I mean, it definitely was like, is expensive. Um, and I definitely was like, oh, should I do this? Because um, of the price, but it was totally worth it. I, yeah. I to kind of told myself based on like some things that I've just read and heard from very successful people, the best kind of investments you can make are the ones in yourself. And that's what I saw in this yeah. program. It's fully agreed. Yeah. If you don't do it, no one will. So no and i uh, as, you, as, again i i like the fact that you you decided to do investments like this so early in your career yes. i think it took me a few years to to understand this lesson so uh again yeah. this is this makes all the difference uh, so coming from a background like i said where i started off ios development just teaching myself i had to do a lot of trial and error and as I've gotten older, I realize trial and error is you should avoid learning from trial and error if possible. The best ways and the fastest ways to learn things are from just maybe paying someone to teach you. Yeah. Because even though you're giving up that that financial uh, that financial value, right? You're you're getting that time back because you're not having to go out and search all these different yeah. things that you're trying to learn. Maybe the first one you stumble upon is not the right way, but then you're already stuck in that pattern and you have to unlearn that later. It's just better to learn everything right the first time. Agreed. Yeah. J just imagine as, a, as, a, as an example from real life, just trying to learn to swim on yourself, just jumping in a yeah. pool or going in with an instructor like how, how how different can can those turn out to be like for the the first one is even risking your own life if you don't know how to swim so yeah it's like you said it's better to to get the expert if possible and uh, teach you like of course you have to work but at least you're working in in a in a right direction as opposed to just improvise yeah so yeah totally totally Okay, so uh, after you decided to join, can you tell me what was studying like for you? How, how much time did you allocate? How did you do it? Yeah, whenever I first started, I was moving pretty quickly. I was, like I said, I was preparing for interviews at the time, which meant I was doing a lot of leak code style problems. Like every day I was doing like two hours of leak code. But I dropped all that when I started this program and I just for about a month, I started working on the program directly, putting in and, uh, like two hours a day, just doing the courses uh, and the, the lectures. I the way I would do the lectures, I, I pretty much just followed exactly what was taught in the beginning of the course. Whenever you first join, you have uh, like an intro uh, Zoom call where you get to meet everyone that's in the, going to be in your cohort. And then also uh, Mike and Cal are on and they, and they tell you about how to do the program, which means like watching the lecture once or twice, reading the description under the lecture and then like reading the questions. And then I usually will watch the video lecture once and then on the second time, I'll go in and actually do the code implementation. I find that that's probably the best because if you're having this pause, the course, every time you're writing some code, you kind of get lost in what's actually going on in the whole lecture, right? So yeah. 
Well, I know at least one person that did it like that. <laughs> Me, when I was a student. Yeah. So uh, I, I also noticed different people have different styles. But yeah, I, I understand why that could be, uh, could be a bit, a bit uh, hard to follow, like you said. So uh, yeah, cool, cool. So let's look back at some of the issues you were having when you decided to join and also things you were looking for, like how to do modular design, how to apply solid principles, testability, I think we mentioned architecture, all these, all these things. And now from the perspective of taking the lectures, how, how you feel about these? Uh, yeah, I... I... I think that one of the things that I really enjoyed that I wasn't doing so much of before was like actually like you're writing out a diagram of uh, what you're thinking about before you code. It's really a problem that I feel like a lot of beginner developers and including myself have done, which is you start writing code before you've even thought about the problem. Exactly. Which like especially in these big tech interviews that will get you an immediately yeah. fail even That's if you implement flag. it yeah even if you implement it correctly you need to show that you actually put thought into the planning before you start implementing because you're not going to get it right the first time yeah. every single time you need to take that extra step before you start programming to Think about the problem and hopefully during that thought exercise, you can find edge cases that you would have found on the fly, which would have caused you to have to go back and rewrite your exactly. code. Exactly. And that's definitely a, something that this course does a great job of. And that, I, I mean, it comes with test driven development as well, but I feel like just seeing how that's done it also helped with like system design interviews as well because like you're literally in the system design interviews drawing diagrams that are drawn in the yeah. course and yeah. they're probably a little more detailed than what's done in the course just because they want to in the interviews they want to know exactly what like is going on in those modules not just the box and then what's called and the dependency arrows yeah. going all over the place but it was a good starting place for that. Yeah, totally. I mean, it probably in a under an hour interview, you try to be as efficient as possible. So you don't like draw a part of the system, then raise it, then draw another. You kind of do a one diagram, which you build yeah. upon through the entire interview. So it gets more complex as they give you more requirements yeah. or... But, yeah, uh, that's typically what happened. Like what I'd really try to do in these system design interviews is if they let me, I mean, sometimes the interviewers, they want you to take it one step at a time, but I would yeah. always try to create just like a very high level system at first with just the boxes with what they're called and the dependency arrows. And then after that, be like, okay, now which one of these do you want to focus on? And then you'll go in and zoom in on just that one yeah. section and explore that. And that's those system design interviews where that was able to, where I was able to do that, I aced, like I really did well on those. Awesome. I, I think yeah. that's partially because that's how they work too. So yeah. when you, when they see a process like that, uh, they immediately click. So Right. That's how you should do it. I mean, that's really what's going on in the course too. But yeah. even just like with coding problems, whenever you're doing your algorithm and data structure interview questions, it, you never want to just like dive into it. You want to be like speaking out loud, talking and write down test cases. They're not going to expect you to like, you're not expected to write out like your entire like interface and like what you're, method is going to be called beforehand but just like ask clarifying questions really think about the test cases edge cases before you start as well as like what kind of inputs your method should have and then you can go in and write the method and or like classes or whatever you need for that particular problem right 
Yeah. Right. But yeah, it's free planning. This course does really well at. Right. Yeah. So w would it be fair to say that you are in a better position now to just do architecture? Uh, yeah, problems absolutely. Solving? Yeah, absolutely. I definitely have taken this and like used it in my own, my current role as well. Like I've definitely started, we use a service called Confluence and it's where we keep all of our documentation. Yeah. And now anytime I've done something that's maybe not as intuitive, because I do think, I believe that like your code should be the first, it should be on the first line of the documentation, right? Like you should write code that's documents itself. But anytime you write something that's maybe not as intuitive to other developers, you should document it. And I've been able to write like class diagrams with dependencies for each of those features and it's been super helpful to my colleagues and it just makes the work environment better too for yourself when you come back in a year and you haven't looked at this code since you wrote it and to have that context to go along with it is really important it is i i agree my, my only uh, sub sub note would be that i never saw a team that's really good over time maintaining the code and the documentation if it's on a conference yeah. or other, yeah other yeah it's separate service like it's they true. always it, diverge <laughs> they get lost but uh, yeah it's difficult maybe the only thing i've ever done that might help but it's not a guarantee is to write put a link to the documentation next to the code in yeah. as a comment but it might it could change in the future but Yeah, you, typically you shouldn't rely on documentation, but have it if it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I, I tried, like maybe what worked best for me was writing markdown files in the in the repo. So then you add it to the Xcode workspace. And for instance, when you rename something, you, you also see that there are references to that class or entity in the docs as well. But even then... They, they tend to get out of out of sync with the code. So yeah, it's, huh. it's so hard. That's a, that's a good idea. I've never seen that before, though. Doing the markdowns, yeah. that... it's like like a readme. You start with the readme that you get for free when yeah. you create a repo on GitHub or right. anything, and then you kind of split that into multiple uh, files. That's how I do yeah. it. But again, <laughs> not a silver bullet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Also, right. I mean, yeah. So. Uh, how long did it take from starting the program to this point where you're uh, in a very good spot to to uh, succeed in these interviews? Probably, I mean, I made it all the way before I got these offers and started interviewing. I made it through the first two modules, which is the networking layer and the persistence layer. I felt like those were like, good enough to get me to where I felt like I started to have an idea about what uh, like loosely coupled code looks like. And uh, that was good for me to get and talk about in the interviews. I didn't mean, I didn't talk directly about, um, about the course itself in my interviews. What I would try to do is take the examples that I've learned in the course and apply them into my day job. And I was able to start doing that and use examples from my day job that I've actually deployed in production using these the things I've learned. Because it was over a long enough time. It was about um, like probably four months that, from when I started the course and finished. So I had a lot of time to put into practice what I was learning, right? So one of the things that I did in my current job, which I felt like I definitely had a lot of inspiration from this course was uh, we were starting to make a transition from Swift UI into um, from UI kit. Okay. All of our code in the, in the code base was just programmatic UI kit. And for our new features, we were trying to make them with Swift UI. Um, but in the code base, the way our apps worked, the company I work at, we have a lot of white label apps. Um, which means that we have a single like core app that has different features that are turned on or off based on a, 
uh, plist file that's read in and parsed. And that plist file also has information about what the UI configuration should be. So like what colors should be in the app, yeah. uh, fonts, things like that. And that is parsed and we create a UI configuration class off of that. And this was used as a singleton throughout the application. Every other class. <laughs> yeah. So anytime you wanted to create some kind of view, you would have to reference this singleton. And sometimes it was done well where it was injected. Um, other times it was just called freely. And I really did not want us to make that mistake when we were going over SwiftUI. Also because like SwiftUI, you're dealing with value types versus reference types. Like UI kit is everything is a class. You have that mutable state that can be shared across all of your other classes, but Swift UI doesn't have that because it's a, it's a value type. Everything is a, a struct and um, that conforms to the view protocol. And so it really doesn't want you to have state. Yeah. So I, I wanted us to get, we still probably needed some kind of class to maintain our UI configuration, but I wanted to hide this implementation detail from all of the UI components so that we wouldn't be carrying this UI configuration around in every view. And this is something that you learn with like solid principles. And yeah. I learned from this course and I, what I ended up doing was I created a factory that owns this UI configuration. It's the only class in the application that knows about the UI configuration and it creates view modifiers um, using the UI configuration. Oh, nice. And you're able to just call, like if you have a text um, view, you can say text dot text body style primary, and then that's it. You don't pass in anything as a parameter. It's and then it takes care of that that method. That modifier gets called, and it within it it has the UI configuration and can write the text view accordingly. But right. that was something that I put into practice based on this course. And I was able to talk about in my interview as well. And I think a lot of people like to hear that because that's definitely something you want to have in your code base, which is like it's little knowledge about like core implementation details as possible. Yeah, especially. Yeah. You, you want your views to be simple. Yes. You know, not you to have to, any Swift, that complex yeah. logic. Swift UI is supposed to be composable, right? So. Mm -hmm. How do you just want to like, just, it's supposed to be not at all like UI kit, which is uh, like explicit about everything. You want your Swift UI to be implicit. And that was the way to achieve this, which is using a factory that would own that class for to configure the view and create modifiers that could be called on the view right. structs. Yeah. Okay. That was, that was an interesting uh, dive into some yeah. of the tech details. Uh, yeah. But let's zoom out and um, just try to understand better your, your journey. Um, so you mentioned going to all these interviews now um, and getting some offers. Did you decide on any of those offers yet or is that still pending? Yeah, so I actually made my decision already. I haven't started. I start right. next week. So, oh, but awesome. I I made my decision. I ended up with like two really great offers around the same time. And for different reasons, um, like the compensation for both was about the same, but one was remote and the team was a, a, had a much greater scope. And I felt like that was going to be the best for me right now, because what I'm really trying to learn about is software at scale. And I felt like this position would help me with that. Right. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, how, how many companies did you interview with? Like a rough number? So I think as far as like big tech companies go, there was probably about eight to 10, but then I did interview with a few smaller companies. So maybe like, I think like five 
smaller companies. I think all in all, it was between like 12 and 15 companies that I did full rounds of interviews with. Um, and I, the reason why I did the smaller companies is I wasn't necessarily sure. I mean, I was open-minded to everything, but I wasn't necessarily sure I was going to take those offers to begin with, even before I had them. Um, I mostly did, I tried to structure it in a way I did the companies that I cared least about first. And then I did the companies I cared most about at the end because I felt like, like, unless you're just some just genius or you're just extremely good at interviewing, you're not going to be one of these people that does 10 interviews and gets all 10 all offers. Yeah. It's that's very exceptional. Like, you're not going to find that very often. So, what I personally had to do was every single interview, I was learning, first of all, like, what are these companies like looking for right now in 2022? Like, what are they expecting you to know about? What kind of questions are they asking you? If I didn't know a question, I would write that down and I would learn about that topic as much as I could because it would come up again eventually in another interview. Um, and then I also, for behavioral questions too, like I, it took me a while to refine my answers and think about what I had actually been doing the past two years of my job. Right. And even if I did have an idea of what I was doing, I had to figure out what are these companies actually looking for? Cause something that I think is impactful and important may not be that impactful to someone else. So I had to really like, by trial and error, figure out like, okay, like I talked to this one interviewer, he really liked that I said this, but he didn't ask me any questions about this other thing I worked on. I'm not going to bring up that other thing again. So like over time, I was able to refine the things I was talking about so that right off the bat, I could go right into what people cared about most from my experience. And we could just dive as deep into that as possible. And I think that that really helped. Yeah. That's that's amazing. I I am so glad you you told this the story because some of the times we would go just to one interview, right? One company, yeah. or and we either yeah. get it or not. And if it's a numbers game, like if you don't try hard enough, like you said, twelve to fifteen companies to get two yeah. two really good offers, that's yeah. maybe a, a decent ratio. So that's really important for anyone yeah. watching to understand this. It's not like a one, like I, I go to this company, I always dreamt for, and I get the interview and I'm there. Like that happens that. sometimes, but <laughs> most of the time not. So y yeah, you even if you think you're super prepared, just like pick a couple of companies that you would be maybe happy with, but, and you take, if you got an offer from them, but, um, uh, use those as like practice. I mean, it sounds, I, I'm sure if another company was hearing this, they would hate that, especially like recruiters and things like that. But it's the truth, man. Like you gotta, you, you gotta figure out what they're looking for and you have to also practice too, because you're, you're not going to come into the game fully prepared. There's going to be things you didn't even think about. Like there were so many things even that I would consider myself strong in that I wasn't strong enough. You know, I got asked questions that I wasn't even thinking about. I thought I was fully prepared on the topic. And then they asked me some like really minor detail that I didn't had no knowledge about. And I had to go look up that. Yeah. So if you have that company that you want to join, just pick some companies that you may not want to join and do that first and then come back to it and be willing to fail too. Interviewing is tough. It, it's really tough and it's not good to get that rejection, but it's important. You, you got to learn to to fail. Yeah, yeah. it's it's a different skill. Like it's not programming. It's, it's a different yeah. skill. And there's so many things that affect, like for instance, your performance. Like you might be intimidated or feel like you're, I don't know, feel like cornered in some of these interviews so unless you get some some experience it's hard to even show your true value uh, then yeah. you know yeah. you never know who you get so 
I I know cases where I don't know people went to interviews and the interviewers were I don't know had maybe big egos or just didn't like them and it was a poor experience just because of that it never yeah it was never decided on the technical side of things it was more of a chemistry ish thing you know so there's so many so many aspects and that's my I'm I'm glad you were saying like it's hard be prepared to to fail it's not a problem just I, I would say it's a it's a real failure if you don't get the interview and learn nothing from it. Then then it's a throwaway of your time. Yeah. Otherwise, it's D- definitely like don't do this. Like if you are in an interview and you have a bad experience and there were things you didn't know in the interview, definitely don't say like, oh, like they're just being really hard and tough and I'm the next interview will be easier. It's not going to be easier. You need to write down what you didn't know and like, and grow from that because you're, you probably will be asked a similar question in the future. And if, if you keep having this mentality that like, I'm just going to find the easy interview, it's, it's not going to happen and you're not going to be happy with it. So I, by the way, uh, yeah. I was curious if you felt any difference between interviews from the smaller companies compared to the to the bigger ones. Yeah, definitely. I the the bigger ones. I mean, there were bigger ones that were harder than others. Um, but like, I definitely think there is a big difference between like the big tech company interviews and the smaller company interviews I did, just because. Usually they just weren't as in depth. I even had one interview that there was no coding. They were just asking me like iOS specific questions off a sheet. And I was just, I was like totally blown away. I was like, and I got an offer from them and they didn't even ask me to code. So I'm like, you just asked me like, what's the difference between a frame and bounds and gave me an offer. Like, that's a little suspicious, but yeah, it's really like, I feel like most of the big tech companies are about the same. You have um, your first round interview, which is when your recruiter, they call you just to make sure your resume is good and you're not lying about anything. And then after that, you'll usually have one, maybe two rounds of like hour long technical interviews with an engineer well the, they're probably going to be asking you elite code questions so like i was going for mid-level questions or mid-level positions and i never saw a elite code problem in any of the interviews harder than like elite code medium so that might be helpful no i think if you were going for a senior position you'll probably see hards but i was able to get away just knowing mediums uh being able to do mediums and then after those one to two hour long interviews, if you pass those, you'll probably have four or five hours of on-site interviews. They're not on-site, they're gonna be remote, but uh, you're gonna have an interview that's gonna have like an algorithms and data structures, like leak code style problem. You're gonna have an interview that's probably gonna dive more into the domain specific, so iOS coding, and then the system design and then behavioral and that's usually with your hiring manager. And he's just going to ask you like questions about your experience and figure out if you're going to be a good fit for his team. Right. right. And so that's really the whole process there. Awesome. Thanks for, for sharing that. Yeah. I, I recall doing one interview like that uh, maybe 10 years ago and it, it was pretty similar. So yeah, I guess if it works, <laughs> they don't need to change it. Right. Yeah. One thing I will say, though, that I, I'm going to acknowledge that I was probably uh, really helped me a lot for this was that I was remote for through the work in my current job for these interviews. And it, I don't know if I had been in person in an office or something. I don't know if I had, would have been able to do this many interviews as quickly as I did them. Um, there was some times where I had like three on-site interviews within a week and they were all like four to five hours, like 
back to back. Like I don't, on Tuesday, I'd have one Wednesday, I'd have one Thursday, I'd have one, but I was able to like get away with it because I was remote. But so that's definitely something to consider. If you're in an office, you're probably going to have to spread these interviews out a lot longer. Yeah. Right. So just to draw a conclusion, um, would it be fair to say that for, at least for you, getting to getting a, a much better position is a is a process of uh, applying to multiple uh, company offers going through some of these these interviews and getting at least more than one offer to be able to decide yeah. if you just got the one then <laughs> you don't really decide right it's yeah it's just yeah it was one, a lot so. I decided that I wanted to start interviewing this summer back in, in January of 2022. And that process began me just getting on leak code, starting to do leak code problems. One thing that I would change if I could do it over again, I think would have decreased the time frame from me starting to being ready to interview was I probably jumped into leak code too quickly you really do need to sit down and maybe I haven't really done a lot of like being an iOS developer, you're not really writing like data structures and algorithms like on a daily basis. Um, so I, I had to relearn a lot of them and right. I wish. And so I, I took about a month later on after I started late code because I kind of plateaued and I took about a month to just go back and just start implementing like link lists, like graphs, like um, W link lists tries uh like trees things like that and i just like implementing them in swift and then i went back to uh leak code and i was able to like have a much better time with it because i took that extra time to learn the data structure algorithms first and then throughout that process so like i started in january i started learning about like i started knowing i wanted to learn about like architecture and things like that and so that's during that time, I also stumbled across the central developer, hopped on that, uh, hopped on the program and started doing those courses and got through, felt like I got enough out of them to where I could interview. And then I started to interview a, a, in, in July. So, I mean, it was almost like a seven month process for me. <laughs> it was a yeah. lot. Well, and it was, I, was, I was going with these to to summarize for for the audience that it, it's a process and you have to think about it uh, up front so if you are looking for a, a better position a position with with one of yeah. the big tech companies you can't get that overnight so it's a process it takes time you got to interview you got to prepare you go through some of the interviews like we said and like that that was my my takeaway from from your journey is this is important if you want to do it. Otherwise, you you may not get it, and you you won't know why. Yeah, your the takeaway should be your your job probably isn't teaching you enough to get these offers. Right, you're gonna have to put in a lot of time outside of work. Your job is they want to hear the things you've been doing, but definitely these like data structure and algorithms questions and like architecture and design patterns like you're not doing that every day so yeah. you're going to have to put in a lot of time to prepare for that so if we got a takeaway from from this journey uh can we can we get some of the takeaways you got from the program so far yeah so i mean i definitely feel like i said like the takeaways from the program like it's definitely been worth every dollar that i spent on it it's taught me everything and more that I could ever want to know about uh, like design patterns and thinking about your solid principles to create a system that works well together as well as in different components. Um, also just like doing a better job thinking about the problem before you jump into it, you know, actually implementing your, your code and also like testing it as well, because a lot of developers just don't really care about tests but I think they're super important. So um, yeah, I definitely, and the Slack channels like really awesome. Like I had so helpful in there and uh, being able to 
be in this podcast. It's definitely something that came out of being in the program as well. And yeah. that, this has been a really cool opportunity. And so thanks a lot, Bogdan. Yeah, same. I, it's yeah. really interesting for, for me as a developer to, to learn these things, uh, to see your short but very condensed uh, process of doing all these interviews. I'm sure uh, other developers watching will will feel the same like this is really useful information um and any advice for them and myself just always learn you know just like always be like if you find something you don't know don't put it aside and let it become something that eventually like a black hole of like something you don't know about if you don't know about something plan some time out outside of work if you have to that allows you to become at least knowledgeable of that subject. Yeah. And also something that I would advise that I hadn't done a great job of that I wish I'd done beforehand was um, like writing down your accomplishments at work as you're going. So anytime you do something at work um, a year from now, you may want to interview and it's going to be really difficult to recall everything that went on with that. So keep a record of everything you were doing at work. Maybe right. like, yeah, it doesn't need to be super detailed, but anytime you feel like this is really cool that I just did right now. Yeah. Especially on, on things like that, that are maybe out of the ordinary. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's really good piece of advice. And I especially like the, the part where you said, if, if you find something that you don't know, work on it, especially, and even uh, on your own time, because I feel a lot of de developers just want to like, expect to get better and better in their eight hour a day work work job. And that's yeah. it. And I'm really glad that you are already seeing that if you really want to have a meaningful career and uh, progress a lot, that just doesn't work. Like there's, there's yeah. no way the setup and the time will allow you to learn all these things that you should or could. Uh, so it's basically just throwing away potential um, just by yeah. being uh, in your comfort zone, I think. So I'm, yeah, I'm really glad you said that. You're not going to get everything out of your eight hours, if, especially if all you're doing is just writing a table view and populating it with data from an endpoint. Yeah. Like that's not going to get you to become like a really great developer. And if you really enjoy that and you don't care about getting to that point, that's fine too. But yeah. if you do, you have to know, like you got to put in a lot of time. I put on hours of time, but mm -hmm. I do think it paid off. Cause I will say that my offer that I got was about like twice as much as I was making before. So all that time and effort that I put into preparing nice. for these interviews, I feel like I was compensated yeah. um, retroactively there. So yeah. totally, totally. And I, I think the other dimension to it is yeah, put in the hours, but make sure you put in the right hours. So if you're just spending two hours a day reading medium articles in random order, that's yeah. not <laughs> that's not getting you anywhere. So I'm really yeah. glad you have this uh, like organized approach to to uh, acquiring these skills and it's not as you see it's not a lot about frameworks and details on how to use frameworks and uh, concrete things it's more on on these skills that are uh, actually platform agnostic so system design and architecture and testability you see even in the interviews I think they're, they're less focused on the exact specifics, even though they do ask you about it, but I, I, I don't think they're, or maybe I'm just speculating. I don't think they're, they'll drop you just because you don't know a particular detail of a API or something like that. They're yeah. more high level skills, which are super important. And yeah, yeah. I, I would add though there that for some companies I interviewed with that, they, I think they do expect you to at least like, for example, like for eight, for HTTP like protocols, like API protocols. So like they expected me to know like what 
any a little bit about like grpc uh and like of what a rest api would look like what a graphql would look like uh mm -hmm. what like web sockets like you need to know a little bit about that but they don't expect you to know how to implement it right yeah right. okay so uh I, I guess the 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 main advice here is just to be dedicated if you if you're yeah. passionate about this job and if just put in the hours just learn all these all these skills uh, which are so important and never never stop like don't don't limit yourself to whatever your current job is offering um, yeah I think that's that's great um, yeah okay there's always gonna be something better let's go for it if any company or individual wants to get in touch with you for any reason uh, is how how can they reach you you can definitely find me at trip phillips on linkedin too and if i'll give you your my email there if you like it but i'm definitely available on linkedin um awesome. you see what my face looks like and i'm an ios developer so you should be able to find me pretty easily <laughs> that's good linkedin's yeah. usually good to to find people yeah okay yeah thanks trip this this was really nice like i said uh i i enjoyed uh talking to you um super valuable information you shared with us and i i want to thank you for that and just wish you all the best in your career i'm sure i'm gonna hear more great stuff from you uh i hope so i'm, I'm trying thanks a lot Bogdan. i sure. really appreciate that thanks for inviting me on here it's been really awesome yeah. it's great talking to you well deserved thanks thank you so and for people watching, if you want to learn more, just visit us at EssentialDeveloper.com. And there you can find a bunch of free resources to improve your iOS dev skills. And you can also find us on the social channels like YouTube and more. Thank you and see you soon. Bye.